Okay, so I was working with somebody earlier on, and it was somebody who was talking about the use of a vibration-only um, remote training aid, uh, along with spray, um, training collars, and static pulse collars, e-collars, electronic um, stimulation training collars. And we were talking about the differences between them, and I just thought it might be interesting to share with people who may not be aware of how those collars can be applied and the um, pros and the cons of each of them. So if we start with something like a, um, a spray collar, a remote spray collar, there are lots of different brands out there and they range hugely in price, which is generally uh, an indicator as to the quality and the reliability uh, of those collars on offer, though not always. Okay, but generally it's a rough guide. You pay, you know, you get what you pay for basically with a spray collar. And a decent remote activated spray collar has a good range on it. Um, it they're well built, they're waterproof, the battery life on them is good, uh, they're reliable, they generally have a warning tone feature, and they have options in terms of how much spray is discharged. And for anybody who hasn't seen one, I've done a video on them before, but if anyone who hasn't seen one, they're generally a, a dog collar which either incorporates a small uh, box on the collar or has that box built into it. So it has like a reservoir built into it and that's what it is. It's a reservoir with a hole at the top of it and you fill it with compressed air and on the trigger on the release of a button that's pressed by a controller, the reservoir blasts a short um, discharge, if you like, of that compressed air beneath the chin of the dog, and which comes out in like a cloud and a hiss and you can get them scented and various different things. Um, without going over something that I've already said before, for me, uh, spray collars, remote activated spray collars, bark activated spray collars, they have their place. They do have uses for some dogs, but for the vast majority of dogs, I find them to be inadequate um, for the vast majority of training circumstances where, say, I am looking to either build behaviours, to motivate behaviours and strengthen, or where I'm looking to modify and to uh, reduce and eliminate well-rehearsed pre-existing behaviours. So if I have a dog with um, a heavy history of uh, barking at the windows or barking at the doors or whatever, and I introduce a, a spray collar so that it's a direct consequence that when I bark the spray goes off, for some dogs, for some dogs, I can find a uh, good effect. I can find that the dog forms the association, I bark, spray blasts off underneath, um, and that's a good effect for me, so I don't bark anymore, a negative effect if you like, or for me, so I don't bark anymore. Lots of dogs, um, particularly if they're in really sort of like high um, territorial or protection uh, state of mind and they're barking around the home and a spray goes off, it's quite often insufficient to interrupt and deter that barking. And I've heard many, many cases where dogs have just simply blown it off. They don't really care. And people have spent, you know, quite a bit of money on this piece of kit, which now is pretty much useless, really, because once the dog has decided that it doesn't mean anything, you know, it can't do anything more, you know, this sort of like snake's got no bite, if you like, all it will do is hiss at me, then the tool becomes relatively impotent. Um, for short-haired dogs of mild to low um, uh, drive, if you like, or relatively sensitive dogs, the collars, the spray collars can be effective. But it must be stressed that they're effective only in a certain way, and that certain way is that they're a, they're a negative consequence, all right? They're a punitive consequence for a behavior. They can't be molded, they can't uh, be adjusted sufficiently to be able to be something which will develop and which will teach a behavior, which will strengthen behavior. They're always basically limited to the category of something that the dog finds um, unpleasant enough to deter a behavior from happening again in the future or to make that behavior less likely to happen again in the future. So for training a dog, I wouldn't use a spray collar. If I wanted a dog to stop, you know, a relatively sensitive dog to stop nicking food off the side or to stop jumping up on people or to stop rushing the door or whatever, then yeah, a spray collar can be beneficial in assisting a training program as part and parcel of a training program for that. And for anybody who thinks, well, if I push a button that emits a spray when my dog jumps up at people, I will thereby um, generate a fear of people or a dog that then becomes aggressive or avoidant towards people. I have never seen that happen with a spray collar. Never. It's insufficient to achieve that aim. I have seen it be sufficient for the dog to realise I don't want to jump 
anymore when people come in. You know, the people sit down, give it a couple of minutes, then call the dog over and praise the dog. All is good. But I haven't seen this, this big uh, threat, if you like, that is put out that if you do X when your dog does Y, you will end up with all manner of hell. I haven't seen it happen. Um, undoubtedly somewhere somebody has under some certain circumstance I don't know but it isn't it does certainly doesn't occur with the frequency um, with which or that would justify how often this um, uh, likelihood is put out there so that's a spray collar um, they have their places but their place is limited uh, something like a, a tone collar is a weaker version of a spray collar. So, so generally they're um, used for either uh, as a deterrent for barking. They're pretty cheap collars. They're not expensive to buy because there's not a great deal to it. The dog barks, the collar makes a noise. And it's, it you know, works on the assumption that the noise is sufficient to deter the dog from barking again. Highly unlikely unless you have a very sound phobic animal and if you have a sound phobic animal and you're going to use something that gives you know an aversive sound to that then the ethics are a bit questionable in your choice of tool to achieve that aim. The other thing that I can use a, um, a tone uh, only collar for is as a marker so I can use it for clicker training fine no problem at all personally I'd rather use a voice or even a clicker but if you want to use a tone function on a tone only remote collar Fine, fill your boots. Um, the other thing perhaps is that I use it as a signal. So I use the tone as a signal for a recall. So I call my dog uh, by way of pushing this button, which has been associated paired with, with reward for the responding that I get. Again, no problem, but if you're gonna teach a recall, you may as well really teach a recall from yourself. So whether it's your own uh, verbal command or a whistle that you're blowing or something. It may as well come from me. I don't really see the benefit in placing reliance upon a tool that the dog is working to get adequate responding. So then we'll come on to a vibration only collar, um, which is under some cracking ones. Um, cracking ones certainly new to the market. Um, E-collar technologies, pager only collar, um, various levels uh, from zero to 100 of uh, vibration only. For me, a vibration only collar, um, if I have an e-collar which has a vibrate function, I don't necessarily see that I would get a great deal of use out of a vibration only collar. It seems to me like they're um, either a stepping stone for somebody who's cautious about entering into the world of remote uh, the use of remote tools when training a dog. So I'll start at something that I, in my mind, think doesn't hurt a dog. And I have to stress here that an e-collar, regular e-collar, quality e-collar will not hurt any dog. That isn't the idea of them. You might if you're sick in the head, but the tool won't. Um, so this, the, the vibration uh, of a vibration only collar again really relies on it lends itself to several different applications again i can use it as a clicker if i want but generally you'll find that a vibration a dog will will um, respond to uh, as in to move away from or with suspicion or you know with a novelty or we'll look at it as a novel thing um, and again if i was going to use it as a clicker if i was going to use it as a marker i don't really see the benefit in doing that over using my voice if i'm going to use it as a punishment for a behavior so the dog does something and I push the vibration button as a negative occurrence of that behavior then I will need to have a mild mannered a sensitive dog for that to work unless the vibration has been paired with a greater uh, negative outcome then the vibration will develop associative qualities um, through higher order conditioning and the vibration itself can then be used which is how you know some people use a vibration function on a function on an e-collar um, but in and of itself, basically, it's something that buzzes and hums. Some dogs will think, well, my goodness, that's terrible for me. The sky's falling down. I don't want anything to do with that. And it will work just great. Other dogs, they can habituate to that. They can desensitize to that. It doesn't really mean a great deal to them. And even if I take it up to a really, really heavy vibration on them, you've got a dog that sort of like barks at vacuum cleaners or chases hair dry, you know, the movement of hair dryers or fights with hose pipes with water coming out. Um, those dogs aren't really going to respond too well in a corrective sense to the vibration from uh, a vibration-only collar or a pager-only collar. There will be those that do, 
um, but there will also be those that don't. And it's a, in some instances quite an investment to make to find out whether that tool um, is going to be considered uh, if you're looking at it as a negative thing, so you want, I want to use it to um, discourage behaviour, then really I need to understand the sensitivity of my dog um, or the drive in my dog before I make that commitment. Coming on to an e-collar, uh, which obviously I talk lots and lots about. Well, an e-collar, generally a quality e-collar, um, contains tone, vibration, uh, and it also contains a static pulse. It contains a stimulation aspect. Now with, um, sorry, I meant to say about the pager collar only, I can use a pager collar, I can use a vibration only collar to develop behaviours. That's got to be understood. I can use it for what you'd, what you'd call negative reinforcement. So I can use it by bringing it in at low levels to encourage behaviours which the dog can then perform, which remove those levels. So they'll actually strengthen my dog's behaviour. I can train my dog with a vibration only. But the thing with the e-collar versus the vibration only collar is that for a lot of dogs, the vibration is quite startling. Even though all it is is a vibration, it's a hum coming from within the unit caused by rotation, that's all it is. Um, but the dog doesn't know that. And it's how the dog responds that, that is of importance to me, not how I feel morally or um, ethically in terms of the tool that I choose. So because something doesn't have a static um, pulse stimulation aspect to it and just has a vibration, I may feel better about that because I'm not using an e-collar, it's just a vibrating collar, that's all it does. But if my dog finds the vibration of the collar to be more aversive and wants to avoid that sensation more so than it does the low level stimulation of an e-collar, then I'm using the wrong tool because I can achieve the same aim with lesser intrusion by using the static function, by using the static um, pulse, the tapping sensation of a remote collar with the um, electronic aspect, with the stimulation aspect over the vibration. So for me, person, obviously um, the uh, stimulation aspect of an e-collar can rise. And again, I'm talking about quality collars. I'm talking about educated collars and I'm talking about dog truck collars and that I have a range of levels and that I've got a very smooth transition between those levels, backwards and forwards, up and down. You know, and that I can use that in a corrective sense, I can use it in a motivational sense, I can shape and drive behaviours with it, I can discourage, deter and eliminate behaviours with it, but I can do all of these things whilst incorporating into a holistic programme uh, of training. So I'm using my rewards, I'm using my markers, I'm using my negatives, I'm using my pressures to develop what I want. And just on cue, there goes the telephone, which is lovely because I was about to finish anyway. So I hope it's been a benefit to you and I'd be interested to hear any comments that you've got. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers.